Amen. I want to talk with you about a topic I title, The Four Laws of Sowing and Reaping. Open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 11. We're going to camp out there today. There are principles in the Bible that are timeless. This is one of them. It doesn't matter what country you're from or what country you live in, whether you're from China or you're from Bangladesh or you're from Zimbabwe or you're from Canada or perhaps uh, the nation of Hungary or Peru, this principle of sowing and reaping works for you and always will work because God's principles are timeless. Sowing and reaping speaks about sowing and then reaping a harvest. A harvest is a worthy return for your labor. A harvest is a supply of anything gathered at maturity. Proverbs 11 verse 25, Solomon says, One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Solomon is he's telling us this observation that he has experienced so many times that he can actually bank on it. He says, yeah, yeah, what I've seen is that people that gave freely also received. People that held back, holding it tight, they lost. People that refreshed others with generosity, bigness of heart, thankfulness, hospitality, they're always the recipient of the same thing. So he says, there's a law, sowing and reaping. Now, you may be wondering, why do they have a big flower pot on the stage, in the center of the stage? If you weren't wondering that, you should wonder it. Because I realize most of us, we're city slickers. We have no idea, and so I want to bring you behind the scenes into the whole culture of an agrarian society. That's what the Bible is written in, that kind of culture. People were herdsmen. They were farmers. So they knew how to deal with dirt, the earth. They knew how to grow stuff. They understood clearly sowing and reaping. And so we must understand, when you go, you get an apple. Apples aren't grown at Whole Foods in the back. <laughs> Nor at ShopRite. <laughs> They're grown on an apple tree in an apple orchard planted by a farmer. But city slickers, we don't know that. We, we, we don't have a clue. Now, this topic of sowing and reaping, it has to do with money, but it also has to do with a lot of other stuff. But because there have been so many ministers that were, the way they presented it, or they themselves were so jaded and motives were so skewed that somehow it makes the topic have a bad taste in our mouth because of the unpleasant experiences and images that come to mind. And I ask that you forgive all the ministers because of their flaws and brokenness. It bothers me when I see that happen. So I ask that you forgive the entire kit and caboodle so we can look at God's word without being jaded. I do warn you that there's a trap that you can fall into and you have to avoid the trap. And the trap has two extremes to it. And you ought not to get caught in a trap. One extreme is the prosperity gospel. The other extreme is the poverty gospel. They're extremes. And when you deal with extremes that are not scriptural based dialogue or scriptural based theological views, it causes a lot of pain. The prosperity gospel creates the kind of follower that makes them feel entitled to much. Name it, claim it, give it to me. I deserve it. I'm a king's kid. The poverty gospel, people that make a vow of poverty, which is nowhere to be found in the Bible for us to make that kind of vow, they feel entitled to little. Both are bad. Both are destructive. The prosperity gospel creates the kind of person when they espouse that view that has a lack of discipline when it comes to money. 
and money management. The poverty gospel creates lack of destiny. They feel like they can't go anywhere or there's no future for them. God has a financial future for us. The Bible is chock full of knowledge and information about that. The prosperity gospel creates in the followers wrong priorities. It's about stuff. It's about me getting more and more and being a hoarder. The poverty gospel creates the wrong perspective. I shouldn't desire anything, shouldn't plan for anything. Both gospels are extreme. You should take a picture of this so you don't fall into the trap. Because the extreme is not what the scripture teaches. What we must understand and learn, the scripture teaches that a balanced perspective of money is how we ought to conduct ourselves and carry ourselves. Money is not bad. I've never seen a wicked hundred dollar bill. I mean, when I do prison visitations, I've never visited, you know, a fifty dollar bill. So why are you behind bars? Paul didn't say money is evil. He says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is amoral. It doesn't have any moral position. The holder of it ascribes his or her morality onto it. Money is not bad. And so there's nothing wrong with it. Now, having said that, rub your hands together with me, please. Rub your hands together. Okay, now let's teach. Ready? Four laws of sowing and reaping. Law number one, everything starts with a seed. The farmer cannot expect a harvest without first planting a seed. For me to walk over to this flower pot and then say, where is the rose bush? What's going on with the petunias? I don't get it. Where is the peach tree? Makes absolutely no kind of sense. Come on, God. I can't even pray for it. If I pray, I'm tempting God because not only don't I understand prayer, I don't understand that everything starts with a seed. There are some things prayer cannot address because it violates the Word of God and the principle of Scripture. Law number one, everything starts with a seed. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, If you worry about the weather and don't plant seeds, you won't harvest a crop. So seeds, you know, it can be planted in every area of life though because seeds represent your thoughts, your words, your actions. If you think about yourself constantly, I'm ugly, nobody wants me, then all of a sudden you're projecting that and you're developing traits that support that thought because your thoughts are seeds. Your words are also seeds. Words have life. If I ask everyone in here to think of something nasty someone has said to you years ago, I guarantee you, you can think just like that. You won't say, well, wait a second, let me see. We all would know because seeds can be words. And words, the power of the tongue can either kill or make life. So seeds are thoughts, seeds are words, and seeds are actions. Our behavior, genuine or you know, not, create habits that shape us. I love what Charles Reed, the English novelist, said. Sow a thought and you reap an act. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Everything started, destiny started from your thoughts. Because law number one, everything starts with a seed. Think about the patriarch in Genesis 26. Verse 1 introduces to us the setting. There was a famine in the land. And then verse 12 tells us, Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. Take a step back. 
It was famine. Prayer didn't change it. Wishing didn't change it. Isaac planted a seed. And Isaac did not reap because he was Abraham's son. He reaped because he sowed a seed. Everything starts with a seed. Isaac didn't reap because he succumbed to entitlement perspective. God, do you know who I am? Do you know whose son I am? Abraham. You know Abraham? The one who you said is the father of many nations? I'm his boy. This famine, God, bless me because I'm Abraham's son. Entitlement perspective didn't work. Isaac reaped because he sowed a seed. Everything starts with a seed. Isaac did not reap because God felt sorry for him. A lot of people take that perspective. God, I'm having it so tough. It's so bad. You don't know what's going on. Everything you know, is just falling apart. Everybody hates me. God is very sympathetic towards your situation. And in fact, the scripture tells us that he is our priest. And he cares about what we're going through. But sympathy and your crying and your solicitation of God's sympathy towards you doesn't bring the harvest. Isaac reaped because he sowed. Everything starts with a seed. I remember before there was a West Campus, we had the East Campus. And we used to hold national conferences, particularly on the topic of worship. Every spring we'd do something called Worship Fest. And since I travel across the nation overseas, I would invite all those venues and people in those settings to come because they're always curious, What's, let's see what Christ Church, Christ Church is like in the worship experiences. They'd come. And the, West, the East Campus was burgeoning with people. Every room in the whole building filled with people from all over the country. And there are a lot of politicians that would come. And politicians from the local state of New Jersey and Montclair. And one of those conferences, I asked the mayor of Montclair to greet the people that have come from all over the country. So the mayor stood up and said, I want to welcome you to the township of Montclair. People applauded. I didn't think anything of it. I just thought I was showing some northern hospitality, that's all. After the service, this pastor had come from Florida came to me and said, David, I love the platform that God's given your church and having inroads into the political arena. I want that in our church. Not just because it's nice, but I just want to influence culture. The moment I get home, I'm going to send you a check because I want to plant a seed in your ministry so I can reap that harvest of that same dynamic in mine in Florida. See, he knew everything starts with a seed. Sure enough to his word, within 10 days, I had this check, $5,000 to Christ Church from that church in Florida because he knew and I knew, nor was I soliciting anything. It was just, he was observing it and he was, in his heart, he was just saying, I want that. And I'm sure there's some things going on. Don't look at that as greed. Just say, say out loud with me. I want that. Yeah. Say it this way. I want one of those. Okay. And that could be a career. That could be a marriage. I want one like that. And so everything starts with a seed. Law number two. You reap what you sow. Seeds carry life in them. They must be planted in order to release the life they contain. You can't just hold them and think that that's going to do it. No. You have to plant the seed. Paul told the church of Galatians, Galatians 6 verse 7. He says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Now that word mocked, it's not a nice word. It means to look down your nose and scorn at someone, to sneer, to jeer, to deride. Paul says, wait a second. You can't sneer at God, live one way, and hope for an outcome that's different. You can't, you know, you, you can't be able to jeer at God or look down your nose at God and say, I'm going to mock God's principles and mock God by expecting one thing having done something totally different. God's, you know, Paul says God cannot be mocked. What a man sows, this, was the, this will he also reap. Each seed, I'm going to my pocket now because I have a seed. 
Cameraman, get a close-up. I actually have a kidney bean. Can you see it? This kidney bean has life in it. But remember law number two, you reap what you sow. This life cannot be released until it's sown. And so let me sow the seed. I just want you to let you know that if ministry doesn't work out for me, I have a side gig of being a magician. So I just want you, I just, <laughs> just want you to understand. But I cannot expect that that kidney bean to produce apples because you reap what you sow. Neither can I pray that that kidney bean produces oranges. Why? Because law number two, you reap what you sow. If you sow the seed of gossip, you'll become a gossiper. If you sow the seed of lying, you'll become a liar. A seed sown becomes what it is in a cellular structure. It's DNA. It's that. In fact, Jesus spoke to it. In Luke 6 verse 37, our Lord said, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will all come back against you. Forgive others, and you'll be forgiven. Well, that's heavy stuff. He didn't say this is not the law of sowing and reaping, but we see the principle worked out. He says if you're judgmental, because that's what judging there means, if you're judgmental towards others, you're going to reap being judged by others. If you are condemning towards others, when you want mercy, you're going to reap condemnation from others. If you are forgiving towards others, you'll reap forgiveness from others. You ever wonder you can go into some homes and you go in, it's like a war zone. So what in the world's going on? The cat's fighting the dog and the dog's fighting the cat and, you know, the guppies in the fish tank fighting other guppies and, and the kids are fighting uh, against the other kids and mom and dad are at each other's throats and then you think that and then they say, it's the devil. No! Now, I'm not his defense attorney. I'm not his litigator. But I will say that someone have sown discord and now they're reaping this war zone of a house. Then you go into other homes and it's so peaceful. And, and you say, I want one. Then they tell you, Galatians 6, 7, you say, I don't want to hear anything about the word. You reap what you sow. Sow peacefulness, you reap peacefulness. Now, Jesus not only attached the law of sowing and reaping to judging and condemning and forgiving, Verse 38 of Luke 6 tells us how Jesus says it also works when it comes to money. Jesus said, give and you'll receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Oh, I didn't say that. I'm not smart enough to, but I am smart enough to read it and apply it. Jesus said it. I remember I was in Kenya a number of years ago, and I frequent Kenya about once a year for the past 15, 20 years on missions and ministry trip there. So I had to speak an engagement in a church about maybe 10,000 people. And the structure, it was a huge place. And the pastor got talking during one of the times when he got up to greet the congregation, he was just reminiscing, reminiscing about when their building was so small and they needed to build a larger facility. And he said to the congregation, folks, we need to build a larger facility, something that can seat 10,000 people. And people froze, oh, because they knew, build a larger facility, 10,000 people, money. And then they said to the pastor, because he had a ministry that took him to America quite often, around the world actually, and he would come to America as frequently as you may go to New York City. And so they said to the pastor, pastor, you need to go to America and get the money. I mean, people in developing countries, they actually think we walk down the street in America and there's gold bullions on the street. I mean, how much do you need today for a mortgage? Go, go down you know, on Oak Street, 32 Oak Street. Go, just be, oh, whoa, this is it. Go on Green Pond Road. There's a whole bunch of bullions. Right at 140 Green Pond Road. <laughs> no, it, it's, it, it's, they think that. The pastor quickly had this retort. 
He said, if I do that, go to America and get money, the Americans will be blessed and we won't be because you reap what you sow. They would have sown and they would reap. Law number three, you reap later than you sow. I mean, that's the idea. You, you don't reap the same time. It would be crazy for me to walk over to this pot and say, look, I just planted kidney beans. Where is my kidney plant? And where are the pods of the kidneys? That's the fruit of this harvest. Because I like kidney beans on my salad and in my soup. I'm hungry. And then I get angry at God. Where this whole lawn of sowing and reaping? It's just a bunch of nonsense that the church established to try to get my money. It's a hoax. A hoax. No! And the church didn't establish it. Look what Paul said in Galatians 6 verse 9. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. What is Paul saying? You reap later than you sow. Think about moms. Any moms here? Wave at me, all the mothers in the house. Mothers are mothers to be. Great. The gestation period of a baby in a mother's womb, nine months. Ah, it's a piece of cake, nine months. I know, you, I, I need men to escort me out of this building after the service for what I just, what I just said. <laughs> Once the seed is planted in you and it grows and matures, nine months later, here comes this beautiful baby. And so, you reap later than you sow. Now, ladies, I know I, I've never carried a child and can never carry a child and will never carry a child except for in my two arms. But I understand. Nine months, uh, that's, that, that's a long time, Pastor. Well, let me give you some perspective. Elephants have a gestation period of 22 months. I just want to let you know that nine months is not that bad in contrast to an elephant. 22 months. <laughs> just, just, just smile, just smile, just smile. I still need brothers to carry me out. But it's, uh, 22 months is a long time. And they're carrying this baby in the womb, and 22 months later, here comes a little elephant. Well, let me put a smile on your face, moms. Possums, the gestation period, is on average 12 days. Don't be a hater. <laughs> but I just want to give you perspective. And so this newborn possum emerges in just 12 days. But I'm underscoring the principle, you reap later than you sow. I love this Chinese proverb that said, if your vision is for a year, plant wheat. If your vision is for 10 years, plant trees. If your vision is for a lifetime, plant people. The first church that we ever planted out of our congregation was Christ Church Howell. We sent out four people to be a part of that church. Brian and Antoinette Attenson were the pastors. And two other people alongside of them. About 21, 22 years ago. Today, it's a congregation of a thousand people. And so this proverb, come on, this proverb is true. You want, you have a vision for a lifetime? Plant people. My point though is that God is intimately involved in our seed and our planting. And so we ought not to be weary when it comes to well-doing. The seed that leaves your hand never leaves your life. It goes into your future and there commands a blessing. God is at work inside of you when you plant that seed. And so I want you to be aware, don't worry. Once you plant this seed, God's doing some stuff that you don't know. Whoa, what's going on here? You don't know. Just like this 
kidney bean is, you see the root system is penetrating the earth. And I told you I had a magician gig on the side. And this root system is penetrating the earth. When you plant a seed, the Spirit of the Lord is making contacts. He's doing things around you. He's doing things in the earth realm. He's doing things in the heavenlies. There's stuff happening, though you don't see it with the naked eye or can understand it fully. The Lord is at work, always at work around you. And so when you plant a seed, it may leave your hand, but it never leaves your life. There's sometimes we're not ready for some seeds we've planted. I've planted a lot of seeds, but later on when I reaped the harvest, I realized that the reason why I didn't reap right away because my character wasn't at that place where I can handle the blessing or my perspective needed to be adjusted or my relationships needed to deepen. So what we must, must recognize is that you reap later than you sow. But don't become weary in well-doing. Bob was an excellent carpenter, and he worked for Frank for years, building houses. And Bob had gotten old now, and he wanted to retire. He wanted to play with his grandkids and enjoy his family. And so he went, went to Frank and said, Frank, yeah, it's been a good run, but I just want to retire and Go and spend more family time. And Frank said, Yo, Bob, I really appreciate that. And I have grandkids as well. I'll probably be following afterwards shortly. But would you do me this one favor? Before you retire, can you build me one more house? Bob said, all right, I'll do it. And Bob went right away and started building a house. But after a week or so, he started getting tired and he started cutting corners and using cheaper materials and doing a you know, slip shot type of job, even though he's always a meticulous carpenter, but he just started cutting corners. And so he finally finished the house and he called up his boss, Frank, and said, Frank, it's done. I, I finished what you asked me to do. And Frank came over and, and to Bob's surprise, Frank had the keys to the front door in his hand. And he said to Bob, Bob, hold out your hand. And Bob held out his hand. And Frank dropped the keys in his hand and says, Bob, I just wanted to give you a gift of a house for all your hard work for me. A smile could hardly break out of Bob's face because he knew the shoddy job he had done. I say all that to say, don't become weary in well-doing. Law number three, you reap later than you sow. Law number four, you reap more than you sow. You can never expect to just sow and then reap the same thing. The law of multiplication goes into effect. Jesus said that in Mark 4 verse 8. In the parable of the sower, our master taught, quote, still other seeds fell on fertile soil and they sprouted grew and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even a hundred times as much as had been planted. Jesus said that. This act of multiplication, he said, look, they planted a crop and this thing grew. How many times? In some soil, 30 times. How many times? In other soil, 60 times. Yeah, he said, but watch this. In other soil, a hundred times as much as had been planted. In other words, this kidney bean plant that I just planted, and it's growing. Whoa, what's going on? It's growing because it's going to mature as a full-blown kidney bean plant. Look at it dancing in the wind. It is having a great time as it's growing up. And now when this kidney bean plant matures, take a look at what it looks like at maturity it, it's harvest time when it matures. And each kidney bean plant bears, on average, 20 pods of kidney beans. The pod looks like this. And you snap it open. On average, each kidney bean pod has six beans in it. I want you to see you reap more than you sow. Now, if I apply some kidney bean math, I don't know if you knew there was such a math, Kidney bean math, on average, one kidney bean yields this kidney bean plant that has 20 pods of kidney beans, each pod having six beans. When I use kidney bean math, one kidney beans produces 120 kidney beans. 
So the biblical law of sowing and reaping is so true that you reap more than you sow. Don't expect to reap what you sow. You reap just not only what you sow in terms of species and type, but you reap more than you sow. And I want you to see just that reality. Now, this is biblical. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 and 7, Remember this saying, Paul says, A few seeds will make a small harvest, but a lot of seeds make a big harvest. Each of you must make up your own mind about how much to give. But don't feel sorry that you must give. And don't feel you're forced to give. God loves people who love to give. And so I want you to see the principle. You reap more than you sow. Now, how many of you ever heard of the giving pledge? As I come to a close. Have you ever heard of the giving pledge? When Warren Buffett and Bill and Melinda Gates got together in 2006 and said, we have so much money. Let's give away more than half of all of our money to philanthropic endeavors to improve the world. How many remember this? They gathered together and had a dinner and invited other billionaires to come to also be a part of this giving pledge or giving pact that they too would vow to give more than half of all their money to philanthropy to improve the world. I, I must say that when I came across this news, I was a bit miffed because I never got a letter. <laughs> you laugh because <laughs> you probably didn't get one either. <laughs> so we all have reasons to be mad at Warren Buffett and Bill and Melinda Gates. So, uh, I mean, what, a check would satisfy my anger any day. <laughs> but, but, but when they gathered together, part of the giving commitment, I quote, is... They said to each other and to one another, those who were invited and responded, the rich should sit down, decide how much money they and their progeny need, and figure out what to do with the rest of it. And would you believe that when they've done this each year, as of 2018, 184 billionaires or former billionaire individuals and couples from 22 countries have signed the giving pledge. And what they wanted to do when Warren Buffett and, and the Gates gathered together, they said the goal is to talk about giving in an open way and create an atmosphere that can draw more people into philanthropy. Wow. Now, let's test the scripture with these guys. In 2006, when Warren Buffett made a commitment to give his money, a lot of money, to philanthropy, he had 50, oh, I'm sorry, he was, he had, his net worth was $62 billion. And in 2018, his net worth is $82.4 billion. Whoa. What's a billion? But I'm showing you the principle. Some people give much, but get back even more. Bill and Melinda Gates, their net worth in 2006 was $50 billion. In 2018, it's $96.4 billion. That's a whole lot of shekels. I'm just underscoring the principle. Law number four, you reap more than you sow. What about you? It's time for you to work the word so that the word works in, you, in your life. I want to pray with you today that you may be able to be someone that, is, that experiences the benefits of the law of sowing and reaping in your life by your thoughts, words, actions over time. Let's stand together.